You put this shit on the accelerator. And when I yell go, you go, Nick. That's from the movie The Signal, where Nick and Haley, along with another MIT student whose name I can't remember, are on a cross-country trip to kind of work on some issues with Haley and Nick's relationship. But what they don't realize is that the hacking they did at MIT is following them because actually it was part of an alien abduction government-sponsored program, really alternative reality simulation kind of thing. Have I lost you? I hope not. Because as wacky as that might sound in the sci-fi movie reality we seem to be in, it might be a lot closer to the non-reality reality we're actually in. And at the end of the day, that's really what this amazing book by today's guest, Ralph Blumenthal, who's authored, I think, the ultimate biography on John Mack. Well, I think that's what it's all about. Here's a clip from the interview. What John Mack has done, along with a bunch of other people, has shifted the burden of proof. These experiences that people are having are not, in the way that we'd normally talk about them, real, because my read of it is they are real. We just don't know what real is anymore. What are your right. thoughts Absolutely. on that? Absolutely. You could not, I could not have said it better. Now, John often said, if anyone has a better explanation, I'm willing to hear it. So it's not mental illness. It's not a mass delusion because these people don't get together. Uh, it's not publicity seeking because they shy away from publicity. They don't want to be known. They're questioning. They wish it wasn't true. It's not books they've read or movies they've seen because kids two years old tell these same stories. So he's eliminated all these other things that it's not. So then he says, okay, so as far as I know, n nothing has happened to these people other than what they said. Welcome to Skeptica, where we explore controversial science and spirituality with leading researchers, thinkers, and their critics. I'm your host, Alex Sakaris, and today we welcome Ralph Blumenthal to Skeptico. Ralph is the author of The Believer, Alien Encounters, Hard Science, and The Passion of John Mack. It's, uh, I really love the title, by the way, Ralph. I, it, it captures so much to anyone who's read the book. You know, there's some kind of, you've done a lot with just a few words there. Even with the end, the, the passion of John Mack, right. I thought was great. So uh, Thank you. Thank you. A lot of work went into that title. <laughs> you know, titles are important. I, I know they are. And, and you just got to admire someone who's done it. And I also just admire this book so much. But let me tell folks for a minute, you know, Ralph is the author of uh, many books, several books, but he's also a very well-respected journalist, having written many years for the New York Times. He is the real deal, and uh, he's done some of his best work with this amazing biography of John Mack, who, if you don't know who John Mack is, we're going to talk a little bit about it, but a lot of this interview we're going to kind of assume that you know who John Mack is. But, you know, before we get started, one thing I want to say is I thought the book was terrific, and it had just so much information about this important part of history that, you know, go buy this book. I, I bought the book, even though the publisher sent it to me. Buy this book. Support this guy. I can't imagine. We're going to ask him a minute how much time and effort he spent in researching all the interviews he put together to do this. And then if you feel so inclined, and I did, write a review. Mine hasn't come through yet, but write a review of the book. So, uh, Ralph, it's great to have you here. And again, congratulations on an important, important book because it's such an important part of history. Thank you, Alex. It's a real pleasure to be here with you. So uh, enough with the accolades. Who is John Mack? <laughs> uh, speaking of accolades, uh, John Mack was accoladed in his uh, lifetime as well as vilified. Uh, he was a Harvard psychiatrist, uh, very eminent in his field, uh, who through a series of circumstances that I outline in the book, um, got interested in the phenomenon of alien abduction. Uh, people, ordinary people from all walks of life, including young children, uh, who um, uh, remembered or had uh, images of or thought that they remembered 
uh, being abducted by alien beings, taken to some kind of craft for uh, strange, bizarre pseudo-medical experiments, including reproductive procedures. Put this in a time perspective and in, in, in a cultural perspective. What year is this? What else is happening around him? Okay. Um, John Mack uh, stumbled across this phenomenon in 1990. So, you know, basically the modern era. Uh, he had been a psychiatrist uh, since the 50s, so he'd already uh, you know, been eminent in his field for 40 years. Uh, he had written other books um, before ever coming across alien abduction. He, he was an expert in nightmares, so no one could ever say he, you know, he didn't know what a nightmare was. Uh, he was an expert in childhood development. He had written about um, a girl who committed suicide, a teenager. Uh, he had written about a Holocaust um, survivor. So he had a wide-ranging interests. Uh, again, before he ever came across alien abduction. Um, so, you know, he was very eminent in his field, which is what, you know, what, what provided, I guess, the shock value to me when I uh, happened upon his story for the book, that he was the least likely guy to be investigating alien abduction. And, and then, you know, uh, the other thing that's always included with John Mack right there in the second sentence is he, he's a Pulitzer Prize winner, which is is really interesting and i love the way you kind of uh explain that in the story because it kind of speaks to this passion and then almost evangelical kind of part of him he won a pulitzer for a, a, a psychobiography really of lawrence of arabia t.e lawrence i mean as i say in the book uh, he went to the movies like everyone else in 1963 to see this long long movie uh, which won all kinds of every prize you could imagine, best picture, I believe. Um, but unlike us, when he came out, he didn't just say, wow, you know, what a great movie. He decided he was going to investigate uh, T.E. Lawrence and spent the next 12 years in um, Oxford and England and, and in uh, the Middle East um, really delving into his life. And then this leads to some other amazing chapters in this amazing life. He becomes this kind of peace emissary. Uh, he's Jewish. He kind of has, it's kind of interesting too about his background. He kind of comes from this very kind of trust fund, rich kid, East Coast, uh, Jewish kind of society. And then next thing you know, he does this, he makes all these fantastic accomplishments. And then he's becomes kind of this peace emissary between Israel and Egypt. And he kind of has that he, he kind of knows the Arab thing a little bit from writing this book. I mean, it's, it's a, again, an amazing chapter in his life as well. Yeah, I mean, I, I outlined all the steps. There was a series of progressions, really, that took him uh, ultimately into uh, alien abduction and finally into life after death. But um, uh, the, the result of the Lawrence uh, uh, biography, which, as you say, won the Pulitzer Prize in 1977, um, he was suddenly considered an expert on the Middle East. You know, that's how things work. You write one book and suddenly you're an expert. So there he was called to the Middle East to mediate the Arab-Israeli conflict. He had an introduction through a colleague at Harvard to Yasser Arafat. And he met with Yasser Arafat, gave him a copy of, of his book on, on uh, T.E. Lawrence called The Prince of Our Disorder. And uh, so he was an expert on the Middle East. And that, you know, led to other things. He uh, traveled widely around the world. He was, you know, booked for lectures. Uh, he also became an ardent opponent of nuclear weapons. And he demonstrated against uh, the nuclear weapons stockpile. He went to Arizona, got arrested with his whole family, his wife and three sons uh, for, um, you know, for protesting. So, um, so there were, uh, I, I think it's very important in the, in the development of this book to, to outline all the steps he took before he became interested in alien abduction. First of all, it, it outlines his bona fides, that he was a serious guy and he'd, he'd achieved a lot and he knew, you know, the human mind um, insofar as it's ever able to know <laughs> the human mind. Um, so again, he, he couldn't be accused later of not knowing what he was talking about, that these people have psychological aberrations or they're crazy. Um, and I think it was very important to establish that. I agree. And to establish that, just as you just said, I mean, he's accomplished. I mean, so he gets thrown in the Middle East thing, but he immediately excels at it. You know, he's well respected by the people he meets. And, you know, he's Harvard. I mean, he's well respected at Harvard. He's well respected within the psychological community and the psychiatry community in general, very accomplished guy. And then as you describe, I mean, 
I mean, I think it's hard for people even to wrap their head around this topic today. We know it is, but he just goes headlong into it. This kind of passion of John Mack, he goes, hey, you know, there's uh, this seems to be happening. And I want you to explain for a minute why he comes to believe that this might be happening because he is a little bit, not a little bit, he is skeptical at the beginning. Right. Should also say, Alex, that he was immensely charismatic, a tall, uh, really good looking, cobalt blue eyes, magnetic to men and women, which got him into a little bit of trouble. I, I mean, he is Hollywood wife. all the way. There's photos in the book. I mean, he looks like an actor. He's stunning. He jumps off the page. Yeah, You're like, is he, this guy he, a movie star? He, 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 and he, and he knew it too. I mean, that's what gave him sort of the confidence. He was, uh, Bud Hopkins thought he had too much confidence that he was uh, uh, really, that was almost a shortcoming that he didn't think he could fail. Um, but uh, as you said, sure, when he first heard about the phenomenon from, from Bud Hopkins, and I tell the story in, in detail in my book, um, he, he was very skeptical. He didn't even want to meet with Bud Hopkins after he heard that Bud Hopkins was investigating alien abduction. He thought it was completely crazy. Um, so he was skeptical in the beginning and everything in his upbringing, as he said, he, he was born in a, a, a material, scientific materialistic uh, German Jewish household, uh, n very uh, secular, non-observant really, uh, and very uh, open to the world and, and science, et cetera, and non-superstitious. So he really was a very unlikely person to be captivated by this, as I say, he was captured, but not by aliens. He was captured by the phenomenon. Um, but what happened is uh, he, he's introduced to this phenomenon by Bud Hopkins, and he collects a group of so-called experiencers, abductees, uh, around Can we him. pause for one second? I don't want to do this too much, but Bud Hopkins, uh, remind people who he is. People might people might know, but then uh, uh, remind them who he is in terms of the UFO community. But then also, right. he's a well-known artist in New York. He, he is kind of a guy with a certain, you know... A, a social weight as well, right? Right. Well, one. I mean, in the course of this book, I deal with a lot of interesting characters, and Bud Hopkins was certainly one of them. Um, he was an artist on Cape Cod and New York. Uh, he was a non-objective artist. He'd been written up in the New York Times. He had uh, really some uh, artistic credentials. And on the way to a party one day on Cape Cod in 1964, uh, he and the other people in the car spotted a UFO over the ocean. And they thought that was cool, and they followed it for a while, and they got to the party, and they told people, hey, we saw a UFO. And they all said, oh, we've seen UFOs. Oh, sure, we saw, you know. So he said, wow, you know, what is this phenomenon? So he starts to study it, Bud Hopkins, and he teaches himself hypnosis. He said, I'm an artist, so nobody cares what an artist does. <laughs> he, he couldn't suffer any loss of reputation. Bud Hopkins uh, researched these people. Uh, and wrote a book long before John Mack ever got involved called Missing Time, where he identified the phenomenon of people who remember spying a UFO and then sort of losing track. And then uh, later in hypnotic regression or even in conscious memories, uh, recapture uh, memories of having been taken aboard a craft and subject to pseudo medical experiments and, and meeting, you know, a short uh, gray being, so called the grays, uh, and all that. So, so Bud Hopkins was already well into this uh, when, uh, when John Mack meets him. And as I said, John was very skeptical in the beginning, but then he gathered his own group around him um, and was absolutely enthralled and, and uh, be bewildered uh, and captivated by their stories. He could not believe this is happening in, in any kind of recognizable reality. Let me interject something here, Ralph, because as this story is told and is repeated over and over again, there's kind of a couple of different ways to interpret it. I think anyone who encountered such a kind of incredible paradigm shifting experience would be evangelical. So I think sometimes when we talk about Bud Hopkins and we go, wow, Bud Hopkins just jumped on this thing. Hell yes, he jumped on this thing. He, he was living in one reality, the reality that we all live in. And then suddenly that reality is turned upside down. And then suddenly he starts talking to these people who are all confirming it over and over again. And then when we talk about the evangelism of John Mack, as you said, a guy who's supremely accomplished, supremely confident, and he is basically confirming 
top to bottom, everything that Bud Hopkins is finding. And you want to say Bud Hopkins is self-taught in hypnosis. John Mack sure as shit ain't self-taught. And he's no. <laughs> getting the same thing. And he's not even putting these people a lot of times under deep hypnosis. He's just saying, relax right. a little bit and start telling me what you believe. So I, I, you're not shading that one way or another. I just want to make, it, there's a difference between, you know, just kind of reporting this matter of factly, but also kind of putting a spin on it, you know, that, that there's a reason that these guys were so excited. Right. Well, or everybody, so, yeah. who ha everybody who has come across this phenomenon is completely blown away by it. Their minds are blown, <laughs> almost literally. So, uh, Bud Hopkins was, and John Mack was. So yes, they become evangelistic because they want to tell the world that they discovered this phenomenon, you know, and, and not many other people were out there, you know, telling these stories. Bud was one of the few, David Jacobs, who came along around the same time, a professor at uh, uh, Temple University who studied UFOs and then became an ardent advocate of, of, you know, the whole abduction phenomenon. But other than that, there weren't many people spreading the word and evangelistic is, is exactly right. John Mack couldn't wait to tell people about this, including a Harvard audience before he, he was really ready to. I mean, he had almost only heard about it before he was you know, lecturing on it to Harvard. And that's one of the, his shortcomings, as I point out in the book, he was he was uh, he passionate, but passionate for sure, uh, over enthusiastic, perhaps. But um, um, so he so what convinced him? Uh, well, first of all, he, he noticed very quickly that the people he was talking to were not insane. I mean, he was a psychiatrist. And as he often said, that's what I do. You know, that, you know, if you're an art, uh, you know, evaluator, arts conservator, you know, when a Rembrandt is a Rembrandt. And he said, I'm a psychiatrist. These people come to me. I know they're not crazy. Um, he, he also said that they were not deluded. They were not, you know, reading off some uh, playbook or so. The stories were basically consistent, but different enough so that they're not, um, you know, told by rote. Um, these people came from a wide variety of backgrounds. Uh, they were young and old, uh, you know, both genders, uh, different ages, and, um, uh, and children as young as two who said, you know, little man, take me into the sky, I fly in the sky. And these kids were not reading books on UFOs. <laughs> and, you know, they were not, you know, playing back movies that they had seen. So this all convinced John. Also, he found that um, there was a very often a place outside the house where they remembered a UFO coming down where the grass was sort of tamped down, or branches were broken. And sometimes they had marks on their bodies afterwards that they couldn't explain. And in one case, it was a quadriplegic uh, who could not have inflicted the marks on himself. He was totally paralyzed. So all these things were sort of fragmentary evidence. And yet um, they convinced John that he was onto something that was happening in some kind of reality. It wasn't just all make-believe. And it wasn't uh, uh, easily uh, provable. It was somewhere in between. It was in some you know, liminal world. Um, but it was true enough so that he thought the people were telling the truth. So let's talk some more about two things, about Harvard and about naivete. You know, because before we even rolled tape, I one of the things I, I really appreciated about the book, although it kind of was a little bit hard to get over, is it's a warts and all kind of honest telling of the account. So if you just kind of like I was and not aware of some of these things, you know, you don't come off seeing John Mack as quite the hero you might have if you didn't know everything. But I want to know everything. So I appreciate okay. that in the book. But so I particularly want to focus on the fact that he's naive, because I think that has an, an, a couple of really, really important elements to play in the overall story as well. Right. Um, he, as I said, he, uh, he couldn't wait to tell the world about this thing he had discovered. Uh, or thought he had discovered, um, and he was naive about, about the reaction that there would be a you know a very negative reaction from parts of Harvard, which came back to to bite him when they investigated him. But um, for example, he told he told a, a woman friend uh, of his as soon as he uh, you know was started looking into the phenomenon. This is what I'm doing. I'm all excited, and she said, "Well, John, um, you know I know you're excited about this, but the rest of the world you know may not be right there with you on this." So he didn't see that. Um, and he, when he uh, gave interviews on the subject to you know, newspaper people, um, he was very incautious. He would say, uh, 
uh, I don't know, should I talk about astrology? Nah, maybe I won't, you know. Uh, or um, uh, he just w w spoke too much sometimes. He should have should have said said less until he knew more. And he'd been warned about this, but that was his nature. And, um, um, and you know, and if we're talking about his character in, in warts or so, th this is not necessarily a character failure, but it's an important element of the story. As I point out, his mother died when he was eight and a half months old. Um, she died of appendicitis. A penicillin had, you know, already been discovered, but wasn't really in use. And so suddenly eight and a half months old, he loses his mother and he never gets over it. Uh, he spends his whole life searching for this absent figure in his life. Um, and I and, and other people I quote in the book uh, make the point that this was part of his search for what's missing in the, con in the cosmos, some intelligent life or some missing entity or God or whatever you want to call it, intelligent um, life uh, in the cosmos. So uh, that's also part of his character. Maybe. I mean, that's a little uh, psychoanalytic and you can kind of go take it or leave it if you want. But what is true is he kind of uses it for an excuse for a, a lot of uh, bad behavior in his marriage and in his relationships that most of us just don't think is very honest or, or what we'd expect from a guy of the standard or caliber that we see. Well, he just he just looks he has frailties. He has human flaws the way that the rest of us do. But I, I really I don't want to get off on that on the personal stuff, because who cares? The part that really interests me about the naive part is that I think it, it plays so well with so many of the, the things I've investigated here is we kind of have a sense that a guy who is a, a Harvard psychiatrist, a world renowned psychiatrist, a Pulitzer Prize winner, I think a lot of us are a little bit surprised to hear that he's naive about kind of how the how the world works and where that really comes through is in the Harvard trial. I mean, this guy, by the grace of God, well, really not by the grace of God, by the grace of a couple of good attorneys that kind of turn up the heat, uh, escapes what would probably be a career ending, what they intended to be a career ending kind right. of event. Walk us through that. I think it's a real important part of this history. Well, let me also say that, you know, uh, his naivete was also a strength. I mean, it was a freshness that he brought to the subject and everything he did. And um, that was not just a negative, but it was a positive, too, because people sensed that in him. He was brimming with enthusiasm, with confidence, and he was a, he was a likable person. So Harvard was not happy with what it was hearing about his appearance on Oprah to promote a book he had written. Uh, he had tried to get a peer-reviewed peer article several times and was rebuffed. Let me set this up a little bit. Just we'll introduce, correct me if I'm wrong. John Mack writes a book, Abduction, Human Encounters with Aliens. As you mentioned, he's already been on the circuit at Harvard in terms of making presentations, doing this stuff. But now he really goes public. Oprah Winfrey, Larry King, he's out there in this way that you're talking about, just open like, hey, this is what happens. Aliens are abducting people and having sex right. with them in order to hybrid humans. You know, that that's the news flash here <laughs> from Harvard, you know? So right. Harvard doesn't like that. So, so Harvard doesn't like that. Now, I make the point in the book, Alex, that Harvard is no stranger to anomalous research. I mean, William James, you know, was talking about seances at Harvard 100 years ago, and they were okay with that. They don't disown William James. But there was something about John Mack that rubbed them the wrong way. And I think it was, as you mentioned, his appearance on Oprah. Uh, he was all over the media. And he was a kind of a open guy about it. And uh, maybe that that disturbed them, uh, apart from the, the subject of alien abduction being associated with Harvard and a Harvard professor. So anyway, they convened this secret um, inquiry, which uh, I call, and they called at one point, uh, and they mentioned uh, as an inquisition. Now, they said to him, this is not an inquisition, but he, he's a Harvard psychiatrist. And he says, well, if it's not an inquisition, why do they use that word to describe what it isn't? So It's not, it's it not about the money. This is not about the money, right? <laughs> right. Um, so uh, it was an inquisition. It, it inquired into his finances and inquired into his mental processes. Did he believe in UFOs? I mean, all these things that really should not be part of an inquiry of a professor, uh, you know, enjoying academic freedom at a, ma at a major university. 
so they uh, called in his his experiencers. They called in his colleagues. Uh, a lot of people. They called in colleagues who were not particularly friendly to him because uh, he took some of their patients and treated them when the when you know fellow psychiatrists wouldn't deal with the abductees. So there were some people who had an axe to grind, and um, the committee spoke to them. And the committee was also a very weighted towards scientific materialists. If you can't touch it, you know, measure it, taste it, it ain't, it ain't there, it doesn't exist. And John Mack was trying to tell them that there are things that we don't understand in the universe, and even physics is be beginning to grapple with these now. Um, spooky action at a distance and all the things that are supposedly impossible. Uh, so he was trying to explain to them that things we don't understand, but it doesn't mean that they're not real. And they said, well, what's your proof? And he said, I don't really have any proof because this phenomenon doesn't lend itself to, to proof as we usually understand it. So they had this uh, standoff. But as you said, John Mack had the benefit of uh, two outstanding lawyers. One was Danny Sheehan, a Jesuit lawyer who had um, uh, investigated uh, you know, the uh, uh, Iran-Contra arms scandal of the Reagan administration, the Karen Silkwood case, he represented the, fa the family in that famous you know, plutonium poisoning case. Um, and the other was Eric McLeish, who uh, had just uh, uh, exposed the priest abuse scandal in Boston. I think it was interesting in the book, and it's interesting here, and I'm not at all against it. When you say Danny Sheehan, then you say Jesuit lawyer, which, you know, like a lot of people aren't cluing into what you're saying there. Jesuit, Catholic versus Eric McLeish exposing the pedo pope kind of whole thing as that's thing. It's very, very interesting that these two guys do it. And there's also a dynamic here that I heard your excellent interview with um, Whitley Strieber, you know, and I've spoken with Whitley a couple of times on this. And there's just a slightly different flavor here that I wanted to ask you about because both Whitley and if you watch like uh, the presentations that uh, Danny has done like on YouTube on this, it doesn't conflict at all with what you're saying. It just puts a different light on it. The, 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 what they paint is a guy being John Mack who's completely out of his league completely lost in the weeds, walks into this thing, basically takes the attorney that the Harvard board gives him. So, oh, you need representation. Here's the <laughs> attorney you should use. And this right. guy's just setting him up for failure. Right. And Danny says, I got in there and I was like, to heck with that stuff. No, well, we are going after these guys and we're going to take them on. But until then, John Mack, it's not his doing. He he kind of goes along. He's smart yeah. enough to get a good attorney and go along, but he's not smart enough. Yeah, he, he he thought it was just going to be a, a, a conversation among collegial, you know, fellow uh, faculty members at Harvard. So he goes in first without a lawyer. And then his nephew, who was a, uh, a doctor at, at the Harvard Medical School, said, what are you, crazy? Are you, you know, trying to channel Lawrence of Arabia, be a martyr like him? Uh, you need representation. So he gets representation, but he gets a lawyer who worked for Harvard. <laughs> um, and that, was, that didn't work out so well because the lawyer, that lawyer's first advice was cooperate with the committee. See what they want and cooperate with them. And then uh, when that didn't work out and he gets Danny Sheehan, Danny Sheehan says, what, are you crazy? This guy gave you, gave you bad advice and, um, and you need a firebrand. Now, Danny tells a story, of course, centering it on Danny. <laughs> <laughs> right. uh, and, uh, you know, so that's an interesting dynamic. He's a very charismatic guy and, and he was very gung-ho. And I read his legal memos on the case and they are funny. I mean, they... Um, are in capital letters, you know, and this but he is went. The he did. Coming. He did go after him, and the evidence suggests that he scared the shit out of Harvard, and that what's that's what really changed the the thing. Well, yes, both of them did, Eric too, but but Danny was particularly combative, and uh, you know something you said about the Catholic uh, Church here and, uh, really resonated with me because remember this: the Vatican is pretty pro UFO. I mean, they are uh, recently. They have a, yeah, well, they have a ufologist basically on stage. They've always been interested in, you know, strange things in the heavens and Marian apparitions. And if you, you know, if you're trying to tell people that there was a miracle 
uh, you know, a virgin birth with Jesus, then you can't start saying, well, uh, these other miracles don't count or these other paranormal things don't count. I mean, that's my take on it. And John met with the Vatican cosmologists, cosmet cosmologists, not a cosmetologist. <laughs> and it was very interesting. He took that very seriously. So, um, but you're right to, 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 to highlight that aspect of it. It was very interesting. And, and Danny Sheehan, by the way, um, as a really firebrand lawyer with Jesuit training, so he had you know, even more of you know prosecutorial uh, zest. Uh, knew something about UFOs. He was interested in them from the beginning, so that was a good matchup. You know, one other thing to just touch on, and I don't know if you got there, but the one thing that kept playing in the back of my mind is, oh, Harvard. You know, we have to keep to these standards. I mean, what about the whole MK Ultra stuff that's going on at Harvard, right? So, you know, there's Henry Murray, who is oh, right. Right, right hand man of Sidney Gottlieb and his OSS, CIA, becomes CIA, and he's directly linked to all this stuff. He's directly linked to anyone who uh, looks to the Ted Kaczynski stuff. That's not just conspiratorial banter. That's just true. Ted Kaczynski well, was in his class, was part of a program. So I don't know if this Harvard board was aware of some of well, Harvard's darker connections, but it seemed kind know, of strange to me, especially when you look into MK Ultra. And again, I don't know if this is your if this is your bag or not, but it, it, it I've is. heard it. I've heard it on some pretty good authority that one of the aspects of MK Ultra was, hey, we might know something about the mental phenomenon associated with ET and. Therefore, let's start looking at the mental aspect of this more broadly, because MKUltra had a lot of tentacles and was looking in a lot of different directions, right. and ET might have been one of them. So do you think there was any awareness there of... I don't think Harvard was trying to cover that up, but I do get into MKUltra uh, a little bit in the book because the woman who um, connected Mac to Bud Hopkins it was a psychotherapist who had come across an abduction case in her... Uh, you know, medical career, and, you know, be became aware of the whole phenomenon of, of uh, you know, alien beings appearing to people. And she sort of uh, told, uh, and she knew Bud Hopkins, and she told John to see Bud. But this woman, whose name was Blanche Chavosti, who's not much information available about her, she's died since, but uh, she identified herself as an MK Ultra victim. And um, horrendous stories. And I looked into MK Ultra for the book, and it was all true. I mean, the church committee investigated. This was a, a dastardly plot by the CIA um, to, uh, you know, administer mind-altering drugs to ordinary citizens to see how they react. And it was a terrible scandal when it came out. People died. People committed suicide. They were driven insane. And um, and then all the records were lost. Uh, quote lost. So um, it, it reads like a, you know, a QAnon conspiratorial, you know, screed, but it, this was true and it was horrendous. And um, so I know Cornell was involved. I'm not sure about Harvard, but a lot of, uh, you know, top institutions um, uh, allowed their facilities to be used by, you know, uh, MKUltra, the, the program and the CIA. So, um, uh, but the one thing that the committee said that was that John Mack picked up on that was interesting the, the committee said, we want to see if you've been adhering to a proper scientific procedure. And he said, what the hell is proper science? I thought science, you know, is supposed to break, you know, boundaries of procedure, not, you know, adhere to certain, I'm sure you have to have scientific, you know, science protocols, but there's no boundaries to what you can look into and what you can't look into in science. Uh, so uh, that was something that the committee thought that this was somehow inappropriate for Harvard and John Mack to be looking into this alien abduction. You know, Ralph, one, one of the things that struck me right from the beginning of your book is I got the sense that from this kind of uh, academia standpoint, that how much times have changed because despite everything we're saying about the kind of deep dark secrets there i got the sense that these guys harvard guys were sensitive to academic freedom and that was really something that they did not want to be perceived as standing in the way of and it really did carry weight i don't think the environment is quite the same today i think 
just people are, are squashed a lot more than they were. And I wonder if you have any opinion on well, how this would all uh, play today. Interesting. You know, we are in what they call cancel culture now. And um, it's true that um, there's a lot less tolerance given the ubiquity of social media to any mistakes or missteps. And people are quashed, you know, they step outside the line, whether it's me too, or, you know, any, any utterance that made in their lives that now appears controversial um, uh, comes back to haunt them. So I think you're right that if this uh, had come up today, there probably would have been uh, less time. John Mack would have been swamped with complaints. And I mean, uh, uh, on the other hand, I think society is more open now to the paranormal. Um, the stories we did in the New York, uh, the Navy videos of, of UFOs, which the Pentagon now acknowledges as, as authentic, have woken people up to the fact that you know, there is this phenomenon out there that is that is a genuine, I mean, these things exist. We don't know what they are. We don't know where they come from. Um, but but they're not, you know, uh, uh, mental delusions. They're not, you know, spiritual constructs. They are physically real. Whatever they are, they're real. Um, let, let's pursue so in that. that sense, society has moved forward. Let, let's uh, push that a little bit further because it's always tricky. You know, these things are real. Like even that simple point that in the book, I have to say, you know, anyone again, please get this book. And here's another reason to get it at the beginning is, I don't know, 50, 60 pages of just a summary of the whole UFO thing uh, from beginning to end and uh, very factual accounts of this account, this account, and then that led to this account. And they're chronologically laid out as is the abduction phenomenon. So I walk away from that saying, okay, this guy, Ralph Blumenthal is just telling it like it is about the reality of this. But by the time you get to the end of the book, there's also this kind of same shift that John Mack does and that so many people do of like, well, how real is it in terms of this consensus reality materialist, uh, go out and drive my car kind of thing? Uh, d d do you feel any need to kind of play in that middle space there? Or is this just real in the way that we think that it's real? No, it's not real. Uh, I mean, Bud Hopkins and David Jacobs together thought it was real. Um, and that it was happening in, in everyday reality. People were really getting abducted by really evil beings for really tra you know, traumatic and horrendous experiments. And John, who, John Mack, who, who started off basically agreeing with that, uh, came to think that it's gotta be happening in some more um, marginal realm because it's not every day. We don't see it. There's no proof of it. You know, we never capture it. It's never kept abductions have never been captured on film. Um, unlike UFOs, uh, let's say whose images have been uh, recorded on radar and, and film, but let's just talk about alien abduction. No, there's no pictures of an alien abduction, no pictures of an alien that have been authenticated. So John more and more thought that this has got to be happening in some other reality. It penetrates our reality, was the way he put it, from time to time in certain ways. But um, it is not everyday reality. And more and more, he thought it was um, linked to other uh, paranormal phenomena. It's not just alien abduction that's standing alone. But there's all kinds of other things like fairy, you know, Irish fairy tales and um, crop circles and uh, cattle mutilations and Bigfoot and Lockless Monster and um, old hag syndrome where, you know, the evil creature climbs on your chest at night and tries to strangle you. And the guy who wrote the book about that, the psychologist, it happened to him. <laughs> so, um, so there's a whole, a whole range of paranormal experiences that uh, he realized are equally mysterious and may be related in some way to another dimension that that uh, impacts our own somehow. And in the end, of course, he was most interested in, in life after death and what happens uh, after bodily death, because um, that's the ultimate mystery. 
You know, the, the only thing that always gets me about that perspective is what I call backdoor materialism. You know, it says, okay, I understand there's this larger conscious reality that extends into these other realms of consciousness that you just talked about. But now let me now switch to my limited, by all accounts of those other realms, my limited understanding of this time and space reality, and let me talk about all those others. It, it seems kind of uh, handicapped capped in kind of a way that doesn't really make sense. I mean, it seems to me that if we're going to make sense of this stuff from this time and space continuum, then the original path that he was down is the path that we have to follow. It, you know, I had an interesting series of interviews on this topic, like with David Jacobs. I had him on the show a couple times and also kind of interleave those interviews with a woman named Mary Rodwell. Have you ever heard of Mary Rodwell? Sure, sure. Okay. Well known, yeah. Nice, nice, very nice person. So they're kind of going back and forth on this issue that you explore in the book of the good ET versus bad ET, you know, evil ET versus spiritual loving, here to bring transformation kind of ET. And David Jacobs, who is, it's important to know, I think, if I can interject, I think David Jacobs and uh, Bud Hopkins have to be understood from an atheistic perspective. That's what they see. When you talk spirituality to those guys, it just complete, they go, you're, you're nuts. I mean, there's not any of it anyway, so why even talk about it? And that's how they see it. But they also have some pretty solid evidence that they bring back that, that says that. I mean, like David Jacobs, some people criticize him that he's not a professional hypnotist. Well, I got to tell you, he's a pretty smart guy. I think he trained well enough, and it sounds like his protocol was pretty good. He tried to intentionally mislead people. You know, he would say, okay, now go over to the corner of the craft, and they'd go, okay, wait a minute, there is no corner of the craft. And he goes, oh, right. okay, yeah, that is confirming what you said. Anyways, I don't want to go on too long in this story, but no, I'm right. interviewing David Jacobs. I'm interviewing Mary Radbull. They're going back and forth. One saying, evil, bad ET, sends people back, rapes people, which comes through again and again. I don't know how how we understand that inside of our culture as anything other than the ultimate intrusion of our personal space, and that is reported. And then go to Mary Radwell, says, look deeper, you know, there's a spiritual thing. But here's the point. David Jacobs goes, the one thing I'm sure is this is a project. This is a program. This is like as we would understand it in our world, somebody's trying to get some shit done, right? So then I go back and say, Mary, what about that? And she does a big long pause and she goes, yeah, well, it is definitely a program. I mean, they, they are doing some kind of genetic manipulation. I don't know what that means. They are doing something. There is an intentionality to it. There is a directive to it. And so I guess I'd throw that out there. And, and what do you think about well, that? Because I think when we jump into that <laughs> other space of other, rea you know, other dimension stuff, you know. Well, listen, as Jack Vallee and other uh, experts have said, if that's the case, they're very bad scientists because they have to keep doing the same experiment over and over again. They want to know how reproduction, human reproduction works. So they take, they abduct a man and a woman, sometimes people who know each other and make them have sex in front of the, the alien beings so they can understand reproduction. So as one anthropologist told me for my book, you don't need to do that. You just get a hygiene manual. Reproduction is not that hard to figure out <laughs> and to make people go through that again and again and again and to you know examine the bodies again and again through all these medical procedures that you know the the experiences detail at great length to the actually describing the instruments used so why do they have to do it again and again and again so when they asked john so so when they asked john mack that same question he said you know what i'm not a good alien psychologist <laughs> He said, I don't, I can't explain why they do what they do. Um, and, uh, but it's clear that they do the same things over and over again. Uh, so, um, and, and Jacobs and uh, Hopkins, uh, you know, found that in their research that uh, it was very highly traumatic. It was akin to rape. They, they ripped out the pregnancies of women who were impregnated on the ships and they took their, 
you know, DNA in their eggs and the sperm from men, and they made hybrid babies, and then they would re-abduct the people later and say, these are your children, and, you know, this was happening in absolute reality, and, you know, well, um, John more and more said, uh, I, I don't know, it, it doesn't, you know, uh, I can't prove it. It, 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 it may be happening, but not in any recognizable, you know, dimension, that, you know, that I can point to. So, um, and then he started, as you say, he started to drift off into other things. And he said, well, let me look into crop circles and let me look into Viking runes, R-U-N-E, you know, the stones that tell the fortune of, of the future. Um, um, so, you know, it's, it's an endless mystery. What can I say? <laughs> it is. Yeah, and I always, I always kind of remind people, you know, I talked to uh, Jacques Vallée too, and I love and appreciate, you know, all the things that you're saying that he brings. But he also carries around that slag from the alien ships in his pocket, too. And when he goes yeah. and analyzes it with the spec, uh, you know, the best microscopes we have, we go, gee, we don't know how to make that shit here on Earth. So there, there is this crossover, as you're alluding to, between these different dimensions, if we want to call it that, or these different realities and our reality. I'm just always a little bit uncomfortable when we speak from the primacy of our reality as say, well, it's well, obviously not true because they're not getting raped. I don't know. Whitley Strieber has said from the beginning he was he was raped. And terrible uh, story. I, he, yeah. He and still, and, he's and still, he says he's, he's still got the implant and and yeah. there's plenty of people have the uh, implant and some of them turn out to be not implants and some of them turn out to be that same kind of material looking stuff that Jacques Vallée walks around with and likes to collect and says, we right. don't know how to make this stuff here. Well, Jacques Vallée said, uh, one of the quotes I especially like from him, uh, he said, I, I'm probably the only ufologist who doesn't know what they are. <laughs> uh, because everyone else is very ready to, you know, uh, opine on exactly what these uh, craft are or aren't. Um, and he goes back and forth. Some days he's he understands it. Some days he doesn't. Some days he says it's real. Some days he says it isn't. So uh, he exemplifies the, the, the ambiguity of the field. Um, you know, I have a quote in my book from Charles Fort, the great anomalist, who said uh, the whole thing is like looking for a needle no one ever lost in a haystack that never was. <laughs> and, uh, it's 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 bottomless. I mean, uh, and that's what you know. Obviously, it, it captivated John Mack because he wasn't finding any answers, and he just kept getting drawn more and more into the mystery. Beautifully put, Ralph. Let's talk a little bit about the media. You've spent a good deal of your life. Hey belly of the beast kind of media guy, <laughs> uh, you know, New York Times. Well, tell us about how Mac was treated by the media, both good and bad. Um, yeah, both good and bad is right. Um, certainly he was a darling of the media because he, uh, he was a subject of countless stories in Psychology Today, in the New York Times, Time Magazine, um, uh, all, the, all the networks, as I said, Oprah Winfrey. A lot of the talk shows he went on with his experiencers, uh, often to his later uh, d chagrin and disappointment, because he said we got sandbagged. Because he, you know, again, this naivete. You, you don't go on a, a you know TV, uh, a, you know talk show, reality show, and think you're going to and think you're going to be well treated, you know, because they're looking for blood. Um, they're looking for a story, so, right? Looking for a sensation. Um, so, uh, so in many ways, he was treated badly with, with great uh, skepticism. He said, the Times never wrote me up in, in a way that wasn't snide, was his, his take on it. Um, on the other hand, he was constantly being written up, and not all of it was negative. Um, uh, he was a darling of the media in many cases because he brought his Harvard, you know, bona fides with him. And, um, you know, he was a, such an exalted figure. So whatever he said, you know, made news. Plus, as I say, he's so good looking and so charismatic that he presented a wonderful picture of the Harvard psychiatrist, you know, wading into this um, in a very difficult area. Um, so the media treated him both ways. Um, most famously in my book, I talk about uh, how he was hoaxed by a woman who pretended um, or said she pretended to be an experiencer, told John Mack a fantastic story about being aboard a spaceship with Nikita Khrushchev. If, 
if you would, <laughs> Ralph, go into that in a bit of detail because it's Time Magazine. It is sensational in a lot of ways. And it also has, you know, a little bit of this kind of Project Mockingbird kind of hit piece. The guy, Aviation Weekly, I remember you and Whitley Strieber talking about that. It sounds very fishy on that other level as well, beyond kind of just uh, the, the snarkiness of the New York Times. It's, it's, it has, yeah. if you want to spin it that way, you could as well. So set, to, to kind of tee that um, up, what time, what year was it written? And then you okay. actually know the guy who writes it. So you have yeah. a, an you extra know, inside, uh, insight. Talk about it synchronicity we can talk about that alex because so many ways uh, in the course of this book my path crossed with john mack he was already dead but um with his family and with other figures so it turns out that the guy who wrote this hit piece uh, for time magazine on john mack was a guy i knew a fellow correspondent in in vietnam when i was there for the times he was there for time magazine um jim Wilworth. And we were colleagues, we were friends. So then he crops up writing this story for Time Magazine. And this was the story. Um, there was a woman, uh, an experiencer, who came forward to John Mack about 1994, I believe, around that time, maybe 93. Um, and he was meeting with a lot of people with strange stories. I mean, that's what he wanted. He was collecting as many of these uh, uh, experiencer stories of alien ab abductees as he could. And he would interview them at length, and he put 13 of them in great detail in his book. Anyway, this woman came to him and said she was an abductee, and she remembered being on a spaceship during the Cuban Missile Crisis in um, 1962, um, when we, you know, the U.S. detected missile, uh, Russian missile installations uh, on Cuba, and it was the closest World War III ever came, to, you know, wiping out the, the whole world. Um, anyway. During the Cuban Missile Crisis, she remembered being on a spaceship with the Soviet Premier Nikita Khrushchev and John F. Kennedy, and Khrushchev <laughs> sat in, in her lap and was crying. And, 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 and Mac, again, sort of naively was lapping this up. I mean, this was an amazing story, but it wasn't that much crazier than the other stuff he was doing. Right, hearing. right, uh, right. So, it, you know, it was not that outlandish. I mean, it was crazy now, it sounds. But anyway, <clears throat> so she tells him this story. And, and other stories, and um, um, she becomes part of his experience, a group. And then Time Magazine uh, finds out about her, interviews her, and she tells Time a very different story, that she made up the whole experience of things. She was trying to expose John Mack as a charlatan, and she was not really an experiencer, and she hoaxed him with a story about Kennedy and Khrushchev on the spaceship, and he you know, ate it up, and Time Magazine used that as a symbol of why John Mack was, uh, you know, uh, grossly naive and, uh, you know, should not be a Harvard professor and question his credentials and all. Anyway, it was a very, very. So, so, um, so John Mack later determined when this when this came out in Time Magazine and very, very damaging to him as that he was hoaxed. Um, he countered that he thought she was actually an experiencer and he provided the reasons from interviews with her and interviews she gave before she contacted John Mack with Whitley Strieber and others that indicated to him rather convincingly, I thought in the book, um, that she really was an experiencer and that she had some ax to grind against Mack and her husband worked for US, um, Aviation Weekly. Why did you and Whitley think that that connection with a without getting into too much detail, because we'll, we'll never know the answer, but th there is this ongoing uh, misinformation, disinformation campaign by the United States government, which is just well established as part of your whole rollout in, you know, to December 2017 with Leslie. I mean, they've denied this shit up and down for 60 years right. just vigorously and vigorously fought anyone who said it and one of their mouthpieces was this aviation weekly where they would kind right. of disseminate this this can't possibly be true you would be a fool to believe any of this stuff just if you would right i mean i i never i, I didn't look that deeply into his uh, his his role in this affair her husband's uh uh role in this but it's true that aviation weekly was part of the defense you know press and it took a lot of leaks from the federal government and was quite negative on the reality of ufos 
Um, but um, there was a very telling incident I, I, I mentioned in my book where uh, sometime after this woman, uh, Donna Bassett Rice, hoaxed John Mack, um, or didn't hoax him, uh, but well, whatever, after this affair came out, where one of John Mack's uh, confidants approached her at a meeting and said, why did you do this? You know, why are you so bent on destroying John Mack? And she said, according to this friend who wrote a memo on it, uh, Donna said, because that's how Hitler started. <laughs> which made absolutely no sense to anybody. I mean, you're comparing John Mack to Hitler. I mean, maybe as a cult leader, is, it was her point or whatever, but it was so outlandish. Um, and uh, there were other aspects of this case that you know got really uh, tangled and entangled. But uh, the basic thing is that it was a low point in John Mack's career. It hurt him terribly because it fed into misconceptions of people that he was pursuing a, a fraudulent agenda, which he was not. He, there, was, there was ambiguities to it, but it was, it was always straightforward and honest. He never lied about things. He never uh, you know, hid anything he found in order to make it come out differently. As a matter of fact, if you read his, his first book, which was uh, Abduction, Human Encounters with Aliens, which came out in 1994, it's 13 incredibly detailed case histories. Uh, he doesn't use the actual names of the people, but some of them came out later under their real identity. So I, I knew who some of them uh, were for sure. But uh, you read that book and you are amazed at the thoroughness of his research and how he went into these cases and looked for alternate explanations and dissected the cases. I mean, extraordinary work. Um, and uh, and the book was a bestseller. Uh, I mean, it, it deserved it. It was it was, it was rightly sensational. Ralph, how do things uh, end for John? I mean, both, you know, at the very end of his life, but also it's it, the whole second book is so interesting, from uh, from so many angles. From he changes his position, but it's also interesting, kind of as a as you explore from a kind of social media that we're all familiar with, it's like he's old news. He comes out with what he thinks is going to be the bombshell second book. And everyone's like, oh, John Mack, you know, forget him. We're on to the next thing. Yeah. And also, so maybe just that. Well, how's that? Yeah, it's kind of sad. So uh, after um, uh, when, when Abduction came out, his first book, which was a bestseller, uh, people with critics picked it apart. Um, and said, oh, he should have related it more to, um, you know, uh, ancient uh, annals, or show, you know, mentioning UFOs and other cultures and Irish fairy story. He should have put it in a much more of a context. He was too credulous. You know, they, everybody had uh, a reason to, to uh, you know, pick it apart, although many critics really liked the book. I mean, it got very good reviews and, and negative reviews to, together. But they pointed out certain shortcomings in the book that John Mack did not put it in enough of a context. So he, when he wrote a second book called Passport to the Cosmos, five years later, he took steps to address those criticisms. He, he uh, very deliberately put the story into more context. He softened some of his certainties that he put in the first book about abduction being real, happening in this reality. Uh, it could be in a more liminal reality, etc. And um, he said, boy, this book is really going to do it. <laughs> the second book. So he put that out and big silence, big yawn. Uh, maybe history had passed him by. Um, maybe, you know, as you said, the media had uh, the media had moved on, uh, so you know he wasn't the same big news he was five years earlier. For whatever reason, it didn't, and he was disappointed. He thought this was the book that would establish him. Now it's a better book than the first book. It has the nuances I didn't do the first time around. Uh, now, actually, the second book is what connected me to John Mack, because I came across that when I was a correspondent in Texas. Uh, for the New York Times, and I, you know, I found this book, used paperback somewhere, and I said, "Wow, you know, Harvard psychiatrist who's you know, writing about alien beings," and uh, I said, "I got to interview this guy." Now I was naive because he was already famous. <laughs> uh, he'd been on Oprah. He'd been, you know, a bestseller with his first book. Uh, he'd written up in the New York Times. I, I didn't know. I didn't know, even know his name. So I said, "I'm going to give him a call. Maybe I can interview him." 
Um, and then I picked up the paper one day and I saw he'd been run over in London um, by a drunk driver. He was dead. Um, and uh, it was so talk, weird. Talk a little bit about that last year or so of his life. You explore it beautifully in the book. I just don't know how you put all this together because it really feels like you were right there, which is a great feeling for someone who's reading the book. But he's interested in crop circles. He goes to the UK. He's kind of has this relationship thing going on in his personal life. But he's moved on, I guess, is one of the things I said. He's not somebody who's sitting there, sitting at home, kind of waiting for the phone to ring. <laughs> kind of, that's not the guy right. he is, and that's not who he is in this point. And then also any rumors that, you know, uh, you don't explicitly say this, but any rumors that there was any foul play just look like they just don't have any merit to me. But talk right, about that right. last year. Uh, OK, so the last year of his life, he was really exploring uh, other aspects of the paranormal. Uh, he had branched out. He realized I'm oversimplifying now, but basically he, he realized that his focus on alien abduction was too, uh, too narrow. And that there were whole there was a whole other world of anomalous experience that may be tied into it that he had to look into. So um, he was reading books about you know the flight of nine eleven of four eleven I think um, was it four eleven uh, about a mysterious flight that crashed and the people came back uh, the, the the dead later reappeared, and he read books about the conspir so called conspiracy behind nine eleven. And he wrote, a, he got interested in a rock called the Mold, Moldavite, which might have been on the Holy Grail that has you know, mag magical properties that allows the rock to migrate. So he heard, so he was interested in all these things and crop circles. So he went to London and he went to England to uh, you know, the place where the crop circles are very prevalent. And he lay down in the field and he soaked up the energy and he said, there's no way this could be man-made. You know, this has to be you know, supernatural. So he, he, he really widened his perspective. And, <clears throat> and he, to the point where um, he was really uh, got interested in, in life after death, the survival of consciousness. What happens after we die? Does, the, does bodily death mean the complete end of the mind? Or uh, the, the, it, it's the end of the brain? But does the mind so-called continue? And does it connect with other parts of the the cosmos and all these questions sort of haunted him. And and like Lawrence, uh, his idol, um, he thought he he was he was getting tired of life. I mean, uh, associates noticed that he was weary, as he, as as John Mack wrote about Lawrence, and it applied to him as well. Uh, his death was an accident, but it wasn't entirely accidental. So you know he he was he was getting weary. He was interested in. Uh, what would happen to him after he died? He told friends, maybe I can do better work from the other side, uh, things like that. So, um, um, so he was he was ready for another experience, you could say. Uh, I'm not saying he committed suicide when he stepped out of that you know underground station in London and looked the wrong way. Now, that would be a, a mistake. Um, but he was tired enough and was incautious enough to look to look the, the wrong way and got mowed down. Now, immediately at the time, this was in um, 2004, just before his 75th birthday, um, and just before I picked up his book, where I learned about him, but um, um, uh, th there were rumors at the time he was uh, run down that it was an assassination, that he was so prominent, he was such a thorn in the side of Harvard, and uh, you know that there were a lot of people who wanted him dead, things like that. But I got the police reports. Uh, I had access to all his records, uh, all the official records um, uh, in his entire archive, his, his journals that he kept, and all the information you know, surrounding his life that I had complete access to thanks to his. Um, so uh, I am satisfied 100% that it was an accident uh, the, the guy had too much to drink. We know who he was. He's in the police reports, um, et cetera. Now, at the end of the book, I talk about him appearing to uh, friends and, and associates uh, after he died. And I say, I'm not investing this with the same uh, credibility that I, I give to the rest of the book, uh, but there are stories that people tell 
and I think they should be part of the record because uh, it's it's just you know what people said happened after he died, and there were you know a number of stories of him appearing um, with various messages uh, that I found interesting. Again, proof of an afterlife, <laughs> not really, but um, they're hard to shake off. They're just stories, but they're they're anecdotal. I thought those stories at the end of the book and the in the epilogue were were extremely powerful. And the one thing I guess I, I'm kind of going to maybe return to what I said before. Boy, I, I really feel personally that we have to kind of shift our language about that. It's like it's not proof. It's like if if this whole body of information says anything to us, it says that we have to really re understand what we mean by proof. And I always kind of think of it in terms of the burden of proof. And it's like, where does the burden of proof shift? When does it shift? And in this case, like after death communication, to me, the burden has clearly shifted. If, if you don't believe in after death communication, then the burden of proof is on you to show Disproof. that the thousands and thousands of verifiable accounts from all sorts of different sources, from the best medical evidence we can find, from Leslie's uh, excellent series on Netflix and all the rest of it, the burden of proof is really on someone else to show that that is somehow shouldn't be taken seriously. I'd even say that the same is true with uh, abduction. You know, if, if someone wants to say, it, which you raise very, very valid questions, and I love the way that you frame it up, you know, that do we have to consider interdimensional? Do we have to consider whatever that means? We don't mean, when we say interdimensional, you know, it's like, oh, well, that solves it. We have no idea what that means. <laughs> Absolutely or other, right. Or other realms <laughs> or fairies. But the, it would seem to me that, that what John Mack has done, along with a bunch of other people, has shifted the burden of proof to someone else to say, okay, these experiences that people are having are not in the norm in the way that we'd normally talk about them real, because my read of it is they are real. We just don't know what real is anymore. What are your right. thoughts absolutely. on that? Absolutely. Uh, you could not, I could not have said it better. You're absolutely right that it shifted the burden of proof. Now, John often said, and this is in the book, that um, um, if anyone has a better explanation, I'm willing to hear it. Uh, he said, it can't be, it's not mental illness. You know, I, I say that in the book that I have at least ruled out what it isn't, what the phenomenon isn't. So it isn't, according to John Mack, I mean, I didn't do my own in investigation. He's the psychiatrist, but I looked over his shoulder as he did his, you know, his experiments and his research. So it's not mental illness. It's not a mass delusion because these people don't get together. Uh, it's not publicity seeking because they shy away from publicity. They don't want to be known. They're questioning. They wish it wasn't true. Um, um, it's not books they've read or movies they've seen because kids two years old tell these same stories. So he's eliminated all these other things that it's not. So then he says, OK, so as far as I know, these people, uh, nothing has happened to these people other than what they said because I have no other explanation. If you have a good explanation, I want to hear it. So I start the book with this conference at MIT in 1992 that drew atomic physicists and theologians and folklorists and psychologists and psychiatrists, uh, experts in, in their fields who all came to MIT uh, to wrestle with this uh, story of alien abduction, you know, what this could be. And everybody had their, you know, way of looking at it. And at the end, of course, they didn't solve <laughs> the mystery, um, but they all came away saying that everything we have brought to it uh, doesn't explain what, what happened to these people. So we're left with the mystery, but at least we know what it isn't. And it's not any of these other, you know, it's sleep paralysis. Oh yeah, but it doesn't always happen at night. Oh yeah, I forgot about that. Um, so, uh, you know, one by one, they sort of attack these things. And I, I gotta say, Alex, that if the so-called skeptics, and I don't mean skeptical, I mean the skeptics and the debunkers um, are so intent on knocking this stuff down as myth and, you know, fabrication, if they would do some of the research and read this material that's available at the MIT conference, put out a thick volume of transcripts uh, there's a lot of literature out there of accounts, not only by by people, uh, the experiences themselves, which are anecdotal, but uh, scientists and, and, and psychologists, psychiatrists who have studied this. If they if these so-called skeptics would read that and then say, OK, but and then have an argument 
you know, why this is not true or that's not true. But just to say, ah, this is crazy stuff. Of course it's crazy. Of course it's ridiculous. You know, I have the epigram to, to my book, uh, Sir William Crooks, who said, um, I never said it was possible. I only said it was true. Um, so uh, that's my big beef with the, with the skeptics, so-called skeptics. And because uh, I spent 16 years looking into this uh, and looking to every other explanation. And if there was one, I would have, you know, I'd be happy to say it, that here's the answer. John Mack was completely wrong. Here is the answer, which I alone have found. OK, <laughs> well, you know, I'd, um, I'd add to that that rather than go look through all the scientific studies and all the rest of it, go look at this book. Again, uh, our guest has been Ralph Blumenthal and the book, The Believer, Alien Encounters, Hard Science and the Passion of John Mack. And I, I just want to add to this because I think I just really believe this is true, is that this book is so personal that it brings you through the history through the eyes, like you said, looking over the shoulder of a guy who lives through this and it is a guy that you're really going to be interested and exciting, excited about meeting if you don't know all the details about John Mack and no one could have known all these things. So it, it's, it's just a, a really, really great book and a great accomplishment. Ralph, what else do we need to tell people about what you've done here or about anything else that you're working on? Well, I mean, I'm still in touch with uh, Leslie Kane, uh, my colleague uh, who wrote the series along with Helene Cooper uh, in the Times uh, that brought this whole phenomenon. Um, I'm not saying to light, uh, but that it, that 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 broke the story of the secret Pentagon unit. Uh, investigating UFOs because officially the government was out of the UFO business with Project Blue Book in 1970. Unofficially, it was continuing to investigate, as we know, and there was this you know secret unit operating uh, with uh, funding from uh, you know Senator Harry Reid's office uh, in 2007 to today. The name has changed. It's now the uh, UAP Unidentified Aerial Phenomenon Task Force, but it's the same as. as when we wrote about it, it was called ATIP, the uh, uh, Advanced Aerospace Threat Identification Program. So we're continuing to, you know, to monitor things. There's supposed to be a report coming out uh, fairly soon, later this year. You know, I was <laughs> hesitant. I was hesitant even going there, but you brought it up. December 18th, 2017, the day that will live in infamy. You guys <laughs> broke that story in the New York Times, but this is the one I've gone back and forth with Leslie Kane on. I mean, to me, political psyop from the beginning, that's how it plays. That's how it plays out over time. Does it mean that it's real? Does it mean that you guys didn't report on it in the best possible way that you could? But this thing has such a political feel to it. It's one side of the political spectrum talking as if there isn't another side. You know, at that time, Donald Trump was the president of the United States. He is nowhere to be found in that story. And, and there is no anyone in the administration is nowhere to be found. I think that's very curious. I don't know what you want to make of that. But then the way they've spun that, I mean, the whole thing of, uh, of Lou Elizondo coming out and saying, well, it wasn't really classified. Well, if this isn't freaking classified, well, why do we have a system of classified and top secret? So again, it just has this spin and these guys have lied about this shit for 60 years and now they're gonna roll it out and they're gonna roll it out in the New York Times, which has been especially hostile to this whole topic. And then the way that it's played out on the History Channel with uh, Lou Elizondo and the rest of those guys, it's all Pentagon, Pentagon, Pentagon. This is the, the great threat. This is the new world order threat. You know, we all have to join together as a family, you know, Werner von Braun, you know, this is the last thing they're going to use kind of thing. I'm not saying that is true. I'm just saying you cannot go there, go to this topic and not start pulling apart what the agenda is here because it doesn't look like it's what's being presented on the surface to me. What are your thoughts on all that? Oh, that's a, you, you handed me a lot to deal with there, Alex. <laughs> but uh, let me say, first of all, that uh, I know the way the story emerged, and it was not fed to us. Uh, Leslie, through her good connections, I get it. Was, I get it. 
you know, so she went down to Washington. She heard about, she sat in on the meeting when Lou Elizondo disclosed that he was quitting. We had the letter, you know, where he was quitting and they were afraid to show it to Mattis at the time. Uh, I mean, you know, a lot of weird stuff there. Um, but um, <clears throat> so, th I mean, the first thing is that we dug that story out. It wasn't that the we got no sense. This is a story the government wanted us to write for any reason of its own. Uh, we pulled it out. Uh, she had good connections and um, uh, they didn't hand feed us these uh, uh, videos that came out, the three Navy videos. I think what I think what happened. However, is once I saw, I'm totally with you on all that. I would not question that in the least. But the video, like the first video is like, what, 8, 10, 12 years old. It's not like a new video. Yeah, it was even it was even on it was even on the YouTube. I I interviewed, you know, uh, Kevin Day, who was on the boat. And right. the video, he saw it, and then he had the video in his inbox. You know, he was the he was the Top Gun Navy kind of right. See, and he, he, the video was in his thing the next day, and he said, "Yeah, it was on the internet." You know, and then they took it down, kind of thing. So, yeah, it was floating around. I mean, not, not, we we didn't have them all, but the, the, um, the Pentagon later authenticated the videos. Um, and they were absolutely real and people did try to pick them apart and say oh if you look at it from this angle and this is it's not fabricated these are real objects that were caught on and and then we interviewed pilots themselves that's another thing we did that uh you know shows that um uh, we found these people dave fravor and and ryan um i forgot his last name and D danny o'coin pilots who told us that they eyeballed these things and dave fravor said he watched this thing as it, it was underwater you know and this is a highly decorated you know navy jet fighter pilot who's saying these things so they i don't think they they had a script written for them that they were supposed to tell us this stuff so but i do think that the, uh, the stories we wrote um, convinced the government to come out more, and maybe they realized it's not something that they can contain anymore, that the, the people are demanding answers, so it's it's pushed the process. Um, and, um, uh, you know, uh, there are people in the government who want to see uh, much more come out, uh, you know, we know that. Uh, but there's also a lot of secrecy still involved, a lot of stuff is classified that uh, may not need to be. Uh, the ATIP, as you point out, wasn't for some reason. Um, it's strange. Uh, the, Na the Navy videos were not classified because if they were, we wouldn't have put them out. We couldn't. We don't want to go to jail and we wouldn't be dealing with stolen, you know, a, a leaked classified material. That's not that we've never been accused of that. that you know, we've, you know, know, one of the things that was super interesting during my interview with Kevin Day and it relates back to your book and it relates back to what we we're just talking about. And John Mack is so Kevin Day. Again, he's the guy who from aboard the ship is orchestrating all the communication. So he's telling where the pilot, the pilots, where to go and all the rest of this. Two interesting things come up from his story. One is that he says these objects like 20, 30, whatever were in the air, had been trailing the ship for like seven days. And I said, Kevin, uh, do you find it strange that you didn't report that to your CEO before that? And he paused and he goes, yeah, that is kind of weird. Again, mental aspect of this, but the real clincher is, he said, finally, on the day of the event, I decided to go up topside and I looked through the, the glass and I looked at it and it changed something in me. And he says he experiences what they call Valet Davis effect from Jacques Valet and Davis, I don't know who Davis was, but the, of this kind of transcendent experience, similar to what you're talking about in the John Mack stuff is that there's some kind of extended realm in which he feels like he has some experience. For him, it's kind of traumatic. He has post-traumatic stress disorder, but it's not really post-traumatic stress disorder. It is to kind of textbook valet Davis effects. So I just think it's interesting when we start talking about videos and we start talking about encounters with the craft. Again, it's this kind of huge soup of we don't know how we're being, how we're interacting. It's, it's really no different than the abduction thing, is it? Yeah, uh, it's, uh, I, I say, I mean, I, I, I end where I began with, with the mystery. 
And we have to acknowledge that, that, uh, you know, and what gets me again, are the people who come forward and say, oh, it's no mystery. I know what this is. This is, you know, and then they spin some theory. This is uh, anthropological. The, the, you know, uh, this is uh, the same you know, mythical stuff that, you know, people who deal in Aboriginal societies have been dealing with. It's myth that, you know, they have the answer. But as I say, you got to read all the material before, you know, you offer the answer. So, I guess we're back at the starting point, but it's been, uh, you know, it, it's, it's been a fun journey. <laughs> it has been an awesome journey. And again, uh, required reading, folks, required reading. It's been absolutely terrific having you on, Ralph. Best of luck with this book. I know it's already been super successful, and I know you'll you'll have more and more success with it. What What's next for you after this? I, I You just said that you're going to continue pursuing this field, any books that you're working on that you'd like to talk about, or I know you authors sometimes like to keep those close to the vest. Well, I don't want to talk about what's next of mine, but um, th there's more to be done on this subject for sure. And considering that I spent seven, uh, 16 years, uh, 17 till it came out on this, I'm not so eager to plunge into another uh, subject from scratch, but there's so much uh, to this story and the people I've continued to meet, you know, I keep getting more information now that the book is out. And I heard the other day from a colleague of John Max, um, who said, and I wish I'd had this for the book. She said, uh, you know, I was uh, the, la the last one or one of the last people he saw before he left for England where he was killed. And uh, I asked him, uh, you know, John, wh where are you going? Uh, you know, what are you doing? Uh, and he, he went like this. He pointed to the ground, she said. And she didn't realize what that meant till afterwards. And she found that he'd been killed. So I wish I'd had that story <laughs> at the time. So uh, I keep hearing from people you know, the, the subject is certainly endlessly fascinating. Uh, there's more, you know, um, coming out, obviously, on the on UFOs. Um, there's a lot more to be, people ask me all the time, well, who's continuing this research now? I mean, well, who, who's, who's John Mack today? I say, I don't know. Um, there are groups of experiences who are meeting, you know, uh, um, but, um, considering the wealth of scientific knowledge uh, available today. And I end my book with the story of the Hadron Super Collider and the image of the black hole 58 million light years away that the, you know, they, the scientists caught a picture of 58 million light years away and they can't figure out if people are being abducted because the science is not, you know, the government is not giving money for that. They're only giving money for, you know, SETI and, you know, telescopes. Come on. Uh, there are serious questions here. There's brain research as to what, what parts of the brain are activated when people go through abduction experiences. So, you know, there's a lot to be, uh, you know, researched still, clearly. It's only at the beginning, but it's disreputable still. So we've got to get beyond that ridicule factor and try to figure out what the hell's going on. Ralph, it's been absolutely terrific. Thank you so much for joining me. Alex, it's been great to be on your program. Thank you. Thanks again to Ralph Blumenthal for joining me today on Skeptico. The one question I'd tee up from this interview, and it really, really is a fundamental question I keep bumping into in a bunch of different ways, is what do you make of our reality? It is in many ways the only game in town in terms of a rational, scientific, logical approach. But what do we do with the fact that it may be a severely limited perspective from which we launch into all that logic and rational thinking? What do you think? Let me know. Track me down. Plenty more to come. Stay with me for all of that. Until next time, take care and bye for now.